Hello, uh, welcome to uh, week two of this autumn quarter. For our uh, speaker this week, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Schatz, who is a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Computer Science and Biology at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Schatz holds a BS in uh, Computer Science from Carnegie Mellon University and an MS and PhD, both in Computer Science, from the uh, University of Maryland College Park. Uh, Dr. Schatz holds appointments in the Department of Computer Science and in the Department of Biology at uh, Johns Hopkins. He also serves as a Cancer Prevention and Control Program member for the Sydney Kimmel uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, prior to joining uh, Johns Hopkins University in 2016, he spent uh, six years at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory where he co-led the Cancer Genetics and uh, Genomics Program in the, uh, in the uh, Cold Spring Harbor Labs uh, Cancer Center. Uh, Dr. Schatz uh, still remains, a, uh, remains an adjunct associate professor of uh, quantitative biology at uh, Cold Spring Harbor. He received an uh, NSF Early Career Award in uh, 2014 to research new approaches for uh, analyzing uh, single molecule sequencing, uh, especially for uh, genome and uh, transcriptome analysis of uh, plant crop uh, species. Also in 2015, he received the uh, Alfred P. Sloan uh, Foundation Research Fellowship Award. His main research interest lies in understanding the structure and function of uh, genomes, especially those of medical or uh, agricultural importance. The core strength of his research is in developing novel algorithms and uh, computational systems for large-scale biological sequence analysis, which includes uh, leading algorithms for applications such as uh, de novo genome assembly, variant detection, and uh, other related omics assays. Uh, Dr. Schatz and his group, group's uh, research contributions has had and still having a huge impact in the field of computational genomics. He is uh, not only an outstanding researcher, but also a great teacher, a mentor, and a good human being. I am really thrilled to have him here to present his uh, research work and uh, the title of his talk today is uh, Base Pairs to Petabytes, Computing the Genomics Revolution. With that, uh, I will stop yakking and uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. Schatz. Please take it away. All right. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, and thanks to all of you for uh, uh, coming out today to hear, to hear my presentation. Uh, so just to kind of open, I'm going to tell you just a kind of really high level about some of the things that we think about and some of the things that we work on, and then I'll kind of dive into a couple uh, more specific projects. So uh, broadly speaking, my, my work gets applied in two major application areas. One is in human genetics. Uh, we've participated in some big studies looking at the genetic um, foundations of, say, autism spectrum disorders, variety of different types of cancers, other sort of major uh, human diseases. And then the other half of the time we spend in agricultural genomics, looking at major crop species like rice and corn and wheat and tomatoes, you know, kind of all the crops that feed the world. And the common denominator to these different application areas are sort of the specific technologies that we work with and some of the um, sort of core intellectual ideas that we contribute. So as you just heard, I'm a computer science by training going all the way back to undergraduate. So I think a lot about, you know, kind of algorithmics, data structures, systems engineering, you know, what is it going to take? What are the sort of the systems that we can use to make sense of all these biological data sets? I also spend quite a lot of time working with new technologies, you know, right at the leading edge that often require, you know, very, very new algorithms, new ideas um, to make sense of them. But again, sort of the common denominator is what are, um, looking at these different systems, looking at sort of genetic perturbations and then trying to understand how that uh, impacts disease growth or development. Now, the big sort of the, I'm sure this is very familiar to all of you uh, listening in here today. Right, so the, the common denominator is, is often looking at DNA or sort of related bio, uh, biological molecules and really trying to understand um, sort of uh, what those genetic messages are that are written out in the DNA. So as I'm sure you know, your DNA along with your environment and your experiences really shapes who you are. Sometimes I mean that, you know, very literally, you know, the shape of your body, <laughs> yeah, you know, what you look like is almost entirely determined by your DNA. 
Other characteristics uh, are kind of a blend between your genomics, your, your genetics, and then also your environment. You know, the language that we speak is a great example. You know, um, you can learn to learn languages from all around the world, although kind of the shape of your body, you know, major characteristics are really, really um, strongly influenced by your, by your genome. Uh, and what sort of makes this an exciting era right now is that we're in the era of very rapid technological growth uh, in terms of the genomics uh, sequencing that is available. Whereas the first human genome took more than $100 million, probably more like a billion dollars to sequence, today it is quite routine to sequence human genomes for a few hundred or maybe a thousand dollars. Now we're talking about um, just orders and orders of magnitude in a uh, reduction in the cost. Uh, correspondingly, we're seeing orders and orders of magnitude in the increase of data that are available, um, which is great because often we're looking for very subtle um, signals. So having more and more data um, makes it really powerful. This is a hard number to really, really pin down, but I think it's about the right order of magnitude. I think the worldwide capacity for DNA sequencing is something like 150 petabytes per year. Uh, maybe one and a half million or a few million human genomes have been sequenced to date. Uh, it's growing extremely fast. It's one of on these exponential growth curves. So we're on track to about an exabyte of sequence data every year by 2030, probably sooner than that. And then beyond that, another sort of decade, we're talking about a zettabyte of data, of genomics data um, being um, sort of I think I got, I got I was muted there for a second, but I think we're okay now. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So we're on track to maybe a zettabyte of data um, by say 2040 or probably even sooner. So what, it, um, you're probably asking yourself, is that a what? <laughs> so <laughs> as key computer scientists, we like to sort of um, count in uh, sort of orders of magnitude here. Here I'm rounding um, instead of powers of two, let me just do sort of units of a thousand. Uh, so it's the same way you can have, you know, kilobytes and megabytes and gigabytes. Well, you can also count base pairs in sort of the same units. Today, like I said, we're on the order of like maybe a hundred petabases a year exabyte zeta um, bases are on our near time uh, uh, future. To put like uh, your mind around this, so my iPhone right here has 256 gigs of storage and it's about 7.4 millimeters thick, such that if you, you know, took all of this data that are being produced now and in a few years, um, that's about, um, you know, if you think about what one zettabyte of data would be, that would be in round numbers about the storage requirements for 10 billion genomes. That's actually more um, genomes than there are people on Earth. But now what we're starting to learn is it is often important to resequence your genome over time, especially in the case of diseases like cancer. You may want to uh, resequence the cells in your body many, many times over um, so that you can track those new mutations um, that are, arise all the time. So th these iPhones, um, that's about 4 billion such iPhones. If you were to lay them out kind of edge to edge to edge, this would get you not quite all the way around the earth, but pretty close. It's a, kind of a, an incredibly large amount of data that are, that are being produced. In fact, if you compare genomics to other really data intensive fields like radio astronomy, or even just sort of really data intensive activities like uh, video recording on YouTube, we're kind of all in the same sort of orders of magnitude, hundreds of petabytes, uh, exabytes on our near time um, future. Just really incredible to think about all the opportunities that are presented there. Now, these data are being generated for a whole host and whole variety of different questions, like really fundamental ones, like, you know, kind of what is your genome? How does it compare to mine? How does it compare to other people? You know, maybe you want to learn something about the ancestry of where you come from, or you want to look more sort of specifically about like where your genes are, how are they being expressed, what sort of activity is going on maybe other signals about epigenetics, about methylation or chromatin, or maybe, you know, especially in COVID era, maybe you're very interested in infectious disease, you know, not just your human genome, but what is the interaction with the microbes that live on you, around you, the viruses that are attacking us all the time, you know, how can we respond to, the, to those infections? How can we sort of treat diseases? How can we pay attention to all these mutations? So there's, there's almost a, a sort of endless list of questions to be answered. And I, th I think some of these we can answer today. And if I'm honest with myself, some of these questions will be interesting questions in a thousand years because it is so um, dependent on the environment, so dependent on the system that you're studying 
But the exciting thing is now we're actually can collect data at great scales, so we can start to answer some of these questions. Now the challenge is, you know, there's amazing sequencing technology that can produce, you know, gazillions of, of, of data points, but the instruments are pretty limited in what they can do directly. Um, they're kind of analogous to a microscope. They can see things, but they do not do any interpretation. They do not directly tell you where mutations are. They do not directly tell you what drugs to take. They do not really do anything other than provide raw information. To actually sort of make use of this information, we need software. And to make use of this information at great scales, we need to think about what are the computing systems um, that will support that. And today there is no you know, Microsoft genome products that you can run. The software that we're talking about is largely scientific software developed in academic labs, you know, really at the forefront of genomics um, to make sense of these data. And furthermore, because there's such a great variety of data and, and applications and, and systems from plants and animals and viruses, um, my sort of central thesis today is that we're not going to be able to answer these questions through a single technological innovation. The way we're actually going to make progress is by considering an entire stack of technologies that all have to come together. At the top of this stack, at the top of this pyramid, that will be where biological insight can come. This can be looking at, I don't know, the, you know, the origins of cancer, the cures of diseases, how we can make crops grow better, faster, but we're only can sort of even think about those questions built upon this um, tall pyramid. At the base of this pyramid are all those measurements and sensing technologies out there to be able to collect all this information at great skills, at great scales. This will propagate up into the um, sort of the computational platforms that can harmonize and process huge amounts of data. In the middle there, I think a lot, and others think a lot about what are the right algorithmic approaches to index it, to query on it. On top of that, we need statistics and machine learning that can look for patterns. And then, aha, eventually at, atop this pyramid, we can look very far and be able to address some of these questions. So what I thought I would do today is tell you about some of the latest innovation and to kind of, you know, for this audience, I thought it would be fun to look at sort of different levels of this technology stack. I think there's a tendency to only focus at the top, but us being great computer scientists and engineers, I think we could be really mindful for this whole stack of technologies to see how it's playing out. So at the bottom of the stack is this, this is where the raw instrumentation um, is sort of, sort of the central focus, thinking about, you know, how can we get as much information as accurately, as quickly, and as diversely around the world as possible. Now, today um, I'm gonna to be telling you about a project really led by my um, senior grad student, Sam Kovaka. Uh, we were partnered by a couple other um, uh, PhD students at Johns Hopkins, Jan Fan Fan, and Bohan Ni that also contributed enormously uh, to this project. And the project is gonna focus on this very new and exciting type of DNA sequencing um, technology uh, it comes from a company called Oxford Nanopore Technologies. They're uh, uh, a startup company based out of England. In fact, just, uh, a few days ago, they announced they were going IPO with a sort of projected um, market value of, I think it was $7 billion. So it's a brand new company, yet enormously, um, uh, enormous interest around it already. So Oxford Nanopore, they produce an instrument. They actually produce a few different instruments shown here is a picture of the Oxford Nanopore Midon. I actually have one in my hand right now. It's about a thousand dollar device. Uh, it costs about two bucks. Um, there's like many thousands of these around the world. You know, they're, they're, they're a commodity at this point uh, where you can go out and purchase it. Inside of the Midon, there's some uh, sensing instruments. Uh, and then also there's something called the flow cell. That's where the DNA sequencing actually takes place. Inside the flow cell, there's an array of sensors that can record electrical information as DNA molecules are sort of um, uh, 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 in the sequencing progress. And then at the level of an individual um, sort of molecule, the basis of the sequencing technology is so-called nanopore sequencing. So a nanopore is a teeny tiny uh, protein, a teeny tiny sort of um, uh, uh, a, a, a teeny tiny molecule that pierces through a membrane uh, that, that creates an in an electrically charged environment. So at the top of it, it's positively charged. At the bottom, it's negatively charged. Oh, excuse me, other way around. At the top of it is negatively charged. At the bottom, it's positively charged. DNA is, a, is an acid, it's a charged molecule. So it is naturally attracted to be pulled through, the, through this hole, this tiny hole in the nanopore. 
Uh, as that is happening, um, the DNA molecule will sort of interact, electri electrically interact with the pore, uh, create uh, different levels of resistance that can be measured in the, in, in the form of current uh, as, as individual molecules are passing through. Uh, a little bit more information. So here's sort of a, a scenario. You have this protein pore piercing through the membrane in this electrically charged environment. Single-stranded DNA passes through, and then it gets ratcheted through in these discrete steps. As it's ratcheted through, what you'll observe is a sort of characteristic change in the current that is measured over time. So you see on the sort of the middle panel there, um, that's sort of a picture of the current where it'll sort of, it'll sort of vary between 60 and maybe 90 picoamps as the DNA is ratcheted through. And then the amount of current that is observed is sort of proportional to the nucleotide sequence that is passing through such that you can de decode that electrical data back into nucleotide sequencing. So this offers uh, tremendous opportunities, right? It's very mobile, it's flexible. You can sequence you know, human genomes, plant genomes, uh, microbial genomes, um, certain viruses you can sequence. In fact, um, at Johns Hopkins, I was involved in the COVID-19 response and we, and we sequenced basically all of the early virus genomes using exactly one of these instruments. And it's incredibly flexible, uh, powerful based on this sort of electrical readout of the molecules passing through small pores. Now, one of the very amazing characteristics of the nanopore is as uh, DNA is passing through the pore, you get this sort of real-time signal information, where you get sort of a measurement of the electrical current as the DNA is passing through. And one of the really amazing things you can do is there's an API to talk to this. It connects to your laptop over USB. And one of the amazing things you can do with this API is if this, if this is a molecule that you're not particularly interested in, reverse the voltage on the port and then actually eject the molecule in real time. So this becomes um, uh, this really amazing uh, capability where I can pick and choose which molecules of DNA I'm interested in um, and which of those that I'm not interested in. And those that I'm not interested in, I can eject. Now the complexity for this is the DNA passes through the pore at about 450 nucleotides per second. Uh, an instrument like this has capacity for 512 uh, uh, so simultaneous measurements all at the same time. So this is quite a lot of data that you need to process in real time to decide if this is a molecule or not that I'm interested in. Uh, so what my lab has done is we have developed uh, an algorithm that we call uncalled. Um, that can that, that can make these decisions for you in real time. Decide if this is a molecule that yes is something I'm interested in and I want to keep or no. This is something that can safely be ejected um, because it's you know from a part of the genome that I'm not interested, or maybe it's you know it's a, it's um, in a sort of an infectious disease setting. Maybe you decide you don't want to sequence the human uh, DNA. What you really want to do is sequence all the microbial or viral uh, molecules that are in there. So we can selectively, uh, for example, selectively eject human DNA and keep everything else. Now the basis of this is uh, quite sophisticated, right? We have to do real-time signal processing. Um, to be able to decide is this or is this not a molecule of interest. Now, if you're familiar with genomics, um, a popular strategy for this sort of problem is so-called read, read alignment or read mapping, where you have a database of sequences that you're, that you're um, interested in, and you're going to do um, uh, sort of a nucleotide to nucleotide comparison about the read that you just collected, and then this big database. And again, that database could be you know, the human genome, could have microbial genomes, could be different parts of that depending on what we want to do. We've developed sort of a similar strategy here where the input will be a, a database of genomes, of sort of known genomes that you can use to decide is this something I want to keep or not. Um, and then we encode it uh, using a, a sort of um, a very powerful full text index called the uh, FM index that lets you do suffix array uh, sort of binary search look like queries very concisely in compact uh, representation. And then because the raw data to this uh, liner is actually uh, electrical signal data, we have to do very sort of very fast and efficient um, analysis of the signal data turned into nucleotide sequences so that we can do the alignment. And then furthermore, because we get the data in chunks, um, the way that the, the, the instrument works is you get, um, uh, this is actually a parameter, but you can actually get uh, say about a half a second's worth of data in an, in an interval. Um, we need to be able to sort of maintain all these partial matches so that we can explore in the reference database where um, this uh, molecule seems to resemble or not. So there's, uh, we use something called um, a virtual alignment force 
it keeps track of possible alignment paths in the reference database uh, within these data structures. The good news for it is extremely fast. It's quite accurate. Um, and it is sort of fast enough to enable this real-time uh, signal processing to be able to make these decisions in real time if this is a molecule or not that we should keep track of. Now, uh, we've been applying this in several different scenarios. One of the scenarios that I'm most sort of passionate and interested about is I have a, a, a sort of great personal and professional interest to look at the genetic origins of cancer. Now in cancer, there are certain genes that are known to be associated um, with increased risk for those dis dis diseases. In the case of say uh, breast cancer, you may have heard of BRCA1, BRCA1. That's uh, you know, certain pathogenic mutations in that gene uh, have extremely high rates of cancer, approaching 100% uh, occurrence of cancer uh, for in those women that carry those mutations. So there are certain uh, genes where it's incredibly important to know about which mutations are there, and you want to be able to do it, you know, incredibly quickly. Um, also, you want to do it in a very cost-effective way. Yes, you always have the option to sequence the whole genome. Yes, that is a possibility, but that increases cost, increases complexity. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could just do selective sequencing of just uh, genes of great interest? So there's a company called Invite. They're sort of a genetics testing company. They have established a panel of 148 genes. They're known to be associated with hereditary cancer. So wouldn't it be amazing if we could take um, this instrument and do a focused analysis of just those um, sets of genes? So that's exactly what we did. As a control, what we did was just a standard minion run where we, where we just uh, do whole genome shotgun sequencing, where we're going to collect molecules all across the genome. If you sort of match it up across these genes of interest, you only collect about 5x coverage of the genome, right? So the way that because um, DNA sequences this randomized process, you need to collect data from all over in a very randomized way. Our main strategy for collecting information is to oversample the genome so that we can actually read off the parts that are most interesting to us. Now, if we do this in a regular way, we only oversample about fivefold, which is really not enough information to do reliable variant uh, detection to be able to tell you yes or no, do you have those pathogenic variants? However, if you do this on the fly signal analysis where you can sort of pick and choose which molecules you actually want to sequence, which of those you want to eject, you can substantially increase the coverage that are available. We'll take it to just about 30x coverage, which is clinical grade sequencing of a human genome so that we can get very detailed measurements of the um, variants that are present in these uh, critical genes. So we measure this in several different ways. We looked at single nucleotide uh, variants where like, for example, an A nucleotide is mutated into say a C nucleotide or a G or a T. We get a pretty good accuracy there. We also looked at insertions and deletions where extra nucleotides are added or deleted. Crucially, what we're really interested in are so-called structural variants. These are where larger segments of the genome, 50 base pairs or larger, are inserted or deleted or inverted or otherwise rearranged. These tend to be some of the most pathogenic uh, mutations in the genome. They're also the most difficult to discover. Uh, you just can't do it uh, reliably using standard uh, short read sequencing. You really need long read instruments like the, the Minion, um, although uh, with a single Minion run, you do not have sufficient coverage uh, to measure it. However, using our uh, software, we can pick and choose the molecules and, and get a perfect concordance of structural variants um, uh, discovered uh, using um, uh, sort of the enriched form of a minion run compared to control runs that are many, many times more expensive and, and slower. In addition, because we're doing nanopore-based uh, analysis, we can look at so-called methylation where various chemical groups are added onto the nucleotides themselves. Those can be incredibly important uh, uh, sort of signatures of cancer and other sort of biological activity, and we can read them all out at the same time. So uh, we published a paper on this about a year ago that you can read for all the details, but sort of the short form is I'm super excited about this instrumentation. Um, it's a real-time um, uh, technology that uh, sort of uh, DNA molecules or RNA molecules go in and then electrical data comes out. And then it's up to us computer scientists and electrical engineers to make sense of that signal data to enable um, some incredible discoveries to be made. So some of the things that have been going on since the paper, you know, much greater performance so that we can go to much larger panels. I'm uh, also very interested in sequence, direct sequencing of, of RNA molecules. They have a different electrical footprint, so you can't, you can't just use exactly the same uh, techniques, but now we have that working pretty well for RNA, especially for things like COVID um, and other um, RNA viruses that we can um, scan through there. 
And then finally, we've been integrating um, uh, a technique called dynamic time warping, which is a dynamic uh, programming algorithm for very, very low level processing. That's integrated now, which enables us to detect variants and other things more reliably directly out of the signal data. So stay tuned, check out GitHub um, for some of those advances in the very near future. Actually, many of those are available today. Uh, at the middle of the stack, that's where kind of the algorithms and machine learning start to play in. Uh, this is where I spend kind of most of my time in my lab thinking about. Um, so let me just tell you about one of the projects that we have going on um, that I think is really cross-cutting. And even if you're not interested in genomics data at all, um, presents uh, to, to, to everyone some really interesting opportunities um, to sort of revisit some classical data structures, classical approaches um, in the sort of the modern era. Uh, this is led by a couple of my PhD students, Melanie Kirsch. Um, she's an awesome senior programmer and student that has been researching these and supported by Arun Das, another of my PhD students. So the, base of the, the basis of this project uh, is, to, is to enhance and accelerate a very widely used data structure called a suffix array. So a suffix array is an index structure for text information. So this could be you know, clearly this could be genomes where it's ACGT, ACG, ACGT, uh, but it's also widely used in other applications, any sort of text mining applications, um, you know, it could be English text, it could be natural language, it could be any sort of matching. Uh, the key thing is you, is you want to be able to build this index structure once and then be able to make queries against it uh, very, very rapidly. Um, and it's a full, so-called full text index where you can look for short queries, you can look for long queries, it supports them all equally well. Uh, the basis of the suffix array um, is to, um, from your sort of reference collection, to extract, or at least sort of uh, implicitly extract, every possible suffix. So a suffix is a substring that goes to the very end of the word. Um, extract every possible suffix and then uh, arrange them into lexicographically sorted order. So this is very much like taking all the words in a book and then writing them out in dictionary order. And the key advantage for this is, you know, as good computer scientists can do, when, everything, when something is in, listed in a uh, sorted order, you can do a binary search lookup on it so that you can quickly go from a very large collection, cut it in half, cut it in half, cut it in half, and then very, very quickly identify um, any matches that are present in this index structure. So it's very powerful. It's widely used in genomics. There's gazillions of tools that have um, uh, leveraged the suffix array for, for the matching that it needs to do. Now, as I said, you know, because it is indexing suffixes, what it is really doing is indexing every possible substring. It's a funny sort of statement to say, but any sort of substring that you might be interested in will be the prefix of some suffix, right? No matter where, you know, no matter where the substring may lie, um, uh, there will be a suffix that begins there because there's a suffix at every possible starting point. And then because it's a substring, it will be the prefix of that suffix. So by indexing all possible suffixes, we're actually indexing all possible substrings in a very sort of um, efficient manner. And like I said, you know, we can we can do this binary search lookup. And if there are multiple occurrences, they'll all be sort of right next to each other. Right. So if in this little example here, I'm looking for cat, you know, there'll be multiple suffixes starting at position 17, 14, position zero, position six, and they'll all be you know, sort of right next to each other in the suffix array. It's very much, a, you know, in a phone book, you're looking up, you know, Dr. Smith, you could find one Dr. Smith and then the other Smiths will be kind of right there, right above or right below. It'll be very easy to find them because it's in sorted order. Now, like I said, the way we do searching on this is following that sort of um, binary search like um, paradigm. In, in practice, you would use a few auxiliary um, data structures as, as well so that you don't have to repeat certain matches, but the, the core insight for searching through a suffix array is repeated binary search, where uh, again, you're gonna have sort of your active range, which in the case of the human genome, will start with all 3 billion possible suffixes, cut it in half, cut it in half, cut it in half, cut it in half. And then we just repeat until we find um, either a single position where we found a match, or we would find exactly where there would be a match, but it's not present. Um, so we can report with confidence that what you search in your genome just is not actually there. Now we know from, uh, I don't know, intro to algorithms that binary search requires log base two um, iterations. Um, so in the case of the human genome, that's about 3 billion nucleotides long, that would require about 32 steps. 
And then furthermore, you know, in, in theory, again, an intro to algorithms, what we have learned about is that um, uh, the, the runtime will be totally dominated by the number of steps that need to take place. Such that if you're doubling the size of the genome, we should just add one more step. Um, so it should, we should, um, in sort of, uh, in this sort of plotted in this way, we should see a linear time increase um, as we go to kind of um, more and more queries, and, uh, as, we, as, we, as we go to larger and larger genomes, we'll see a linear time increase in the amount of time it takes. In theory, that's how it should go. However, in practice, and this is true across the board um, beyond just genomics, in practice, when you do binary search, it does not scale as nicely as you might expect. As you move into larger and larger collections, the sort of search um, rate actually slows down, requires um, uh, an excess amount of time to do that analysis. Why is that? It's because actual computers have a memory hierarchy where certain sort of types of information are more rapid to access than other types of information. Again, at the top of the pyramid here, we have you know, the registers in the CPU that can be accessed basically immediately. Then we have various levels of caching. Then finally, we have main RAM, and then even Beyond that, you know, hard drives or network access are even orders of magnitude slower. Now, as you're doing something like binary search over large collections, what are you going to be doing? You're going to be jumping around in RAM um, through very distant related information. Those are going to be some of the most expensive lookups you can, you can make and still fit in memory. Um, so as you're sort of making all these random accesses in memory, all of those lookups will be very expensive. Although eventually, as, as the search space gets pretty narrow, all of that will fit into cache so that your um, uh, performance will, uh, will increase. That explains why um, as you move into larger genomes, you get this slowdown is because you're just not effectively utilizing the cache structure that is present there. So if you think about what's going on here, it's sort of a high level view, right? So normally binary search follows this algorithmic procedure where you sort of repeatedly cut through the search space. The challenge for that is each one of those searches is gonna be very expensive. Now, wouldn't it be amazing if there was some other approach that could take from this large search space and just sort of guide the analysis? You don't necessarily have to find exactly the right position, but if we can guide it down into a smaller range uh, without doing all those expensive searches, we could um, potentially uh, dramatically accelerate a binary search. I mean, even though, I mean, I teach it to all of my students as well, even though, you know, we think of binary search of being this sort of optimized algorithm, you know, in practice, there could be some room for improvement if we can come up for with a clever scheme for getting um, a hint or an, or an estimate as to where the search range might actually exist. So it wasn't uh, only us that had this idea. Um, you know, these sorts of uh, searches have been studied for many years. Uh, one sort of major advance that was published a few years ago, I think is really, really interesting and really, really exciting. This came from some researchers at MIT and Google that proposed that for many of these classic data structures, uh, like bee trees or hash maps or bloom filters, where you know classically we think of them as a purely algorithmic data structure, there may be some opportunities to advance on that using some uh, lightweight machine learning, some lightweight uh, predictive uh, algorithms. Uh, and, kind of, and they call this a learned index structure. In the sense that you know, normally an index structure you know organizes the data in the way that you can do efficient queries on it. But in addition to you know doing all that processing, we're going to add like a little bit of auxiliary information to it that is going to help um, speed up this analysis so that we can do searches uh, much more efficiently. In the case of say a suffix array lookup, you know the key insight is you have to have some sort of predictable uh, representation where for a given uh, a query, like, like, you know, in our example, we had cat or maybe Gattaca, we need some sort of predictable way to say, if I have a query string like Gattaca, where may that fall in the suffix array? If we can have some sort of predictive strategy for that, there's some hope that this could be um, quite efficient. Uh, so inspired by that learned index paper and sort of related literature, uh, we, the first sort of step was um, to see if there would be some predictable pattern how uh, different sequences may be represented um, in one of a suffix array. So to do this, we use a very, very simple encoding scheme where we'll take our nucleotide sequences and then we'll encode them um, into, an, an, into an integer value. So if we have you know, A, C, T, A, G, 
you know, A gets sort of uh, represented as zero, zero, C is represented as zero, one, G is represented as one, zero, and then T is represented as one, one. So it's a very sort of straightforward you know, way to take any nucleotide sequence, uh, convert it into base 10. And then to make it sort of predictable, what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, look at, at this point, just that fixed length uh, substrings called Kamers. Um, so kind of the amazing thing is, is this is shown with the human genome. We'll take the human genome, we'll extract from it every, at every possible offset, a fixed length Kamer, like a 21 nucleotide sequence. And then we'll just ask the question for that 21 nucleotide sequence, where does it fall on the suffix array? We made this plot as sort of a prototype and wow, this really changed our world in the sense that it's a very, very predictable relationship. This is the actual human genome sort of relationship. It's not a perfect straight line, but it's pretty simple. It's a very, very simple relationship, uh, which suggests that you know, there should be some ways um, to make a pretty good prediction such that if you only have the nucleotide sequence without doing an algorithmic search, we can have a pretty good idea about where it may fall in the suffix array. We actually tried a few different strategies for making that prediction. One strategy was to use an artificial neural network that um, uh, in practice can give you very good uh, uh, estimates as to where that sequence may lie, but in practice is also brings with it pretty high memory requirements and pretty slow processing speed. In addition to an artificial neural network, we use something called a piecewise linear architecture, right? You have that pretty nice simple curve uh, derived empirically. We can take that big curve and then, and then just break it up in a piecewise fashion at very regular intervals. We can keep track of the, intercept, the intercepts such that if we want to interpolate any, any position uh, within there, we can do so with just a little bit of arithmetic let us discover, you know, sort of the correct position very, very, very rapidly. And it turns out this works spectacularly well, right? So we took our implementation of sort of regular binary search. We also compared it to a few leading um, uh, uh, algorithms, something called Mummer, another thing called Bowtie that do sort of similar operations. And then what we're showing here is sort of the amount of extra memory, memory overhead that we're going to allow. How much of this sort of sampling do we need to do? With 0.1% overhead, we make pretty substantial gains. At 10% overhead, we get almost a threefold uh, performance gain. Again, what we're doing here is our prediction does not have to be exactly correct. All we have to do is with some confidence, narrow down the range that needs to be searched. And then we can just use regular binary search inside of there to refine the positioning inside of the suffix array. As we scale to kind of larger and larger genomes, this is a really nice uh, plot as well. As you saw before, Normally, as you go to larger genomes, the sort of time requirements skyrocket, but here we're able to maintain that linear timing as we go to larger and larger genomes. And kind of the, re the rationale for that is we're going to skip over those most expensive lookups in the beginning that have all those cache misses, and we can just narrow down into a small interval where we can do a search in cache uh, very quickly. So I wrote a paper about it. We published it uh, just earlier this year. This is called Sapling, published in Bioinformatics. Uh, some of the things that we're working on now are thinking about what other data structures or what other problems would lend itself to this sort of um, technique where you maybe have a classic data structure, but can we turbocharge it with a little bit of machine learning or statistics where instead of having to search through the entire corpus, maybe we can narrow this down um, in a sort of predictable way. And the, the, the whole reason why this works is because it, it turns out you know, in computer science classes, we often, we often think about the worst case performance and the worst case analysis. But in the real world, a lot of data sets have a, a lot of um, regularity to them and they have a lot of patterns that can be exploited as long as you can detect them and you can turbocharge your algorithms and make them go all the more uh, efficient with very, very little overhead, uh, with very little extra complexity in the analysis that needs to take place. Okay, so we talked about, you know, some of the sensors some of the machine, uh, machine learning and algorithms that can be used. Let's talk about some of the novel biology that we've been able to discover recently um, uh, using these season related techniques. And here, this is part of a, a very large international consortium called the Telomere to Telomere Consortium. This is led by Adam Philippi at NHGRI and Karamiga at UC Santa Cruz. I'm one of many members um, that we've been trying to improve upon the human uh, reference genome and see how it improves um, biological discovery. 
So the human reference genome is an incredibly important piece of biomedical data. In fact, President uh, Bill Clinton sort of described it as, without a doubt, this is the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. That was in reference to the original Human Genome Project uh, published back in 2000. You know, for the first time ever, we actually had a map of, of most of the genetic information in a human being. Now that's been an incredibly widely used resource, you know, basically every day, every genetic study uses it in some regard, but it has some problems. Uh, problem number one is a huge fraction of the reference genome is missing or incorrect. What do I mean by that is under a microscope, we can look at chromosomes and we can, and under a microscope, we can get some um, estimates about how big different uh, chromosomes should be. And then there's a bunch of computational processes to do so-called de novo assembly, where we can build up partial reconstructions. And through that process, we can just do simple subtraction. We know how big about, we know about how big a chromosome ought to be. We know how much we've been able to resolve. And then um, there'll be some segments that are missing that just were not resolved using sort of state-of-the-art algorithms. Today, that's about not quite 10%. Um, the human genome is about 3 billion nucleotides long. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of nucleotides, where in principle, any one of those nucleotides could have a major, major component, disease status, growth, other sorts of um, information that you might be interested in. A lot of these uh, sort of missing sequences tend to be highly concentrated in certain regions of the genome, especially things like so-called centromeres. These are the middles of chromosomes that are sort of necessary for so-called segregation. When uh, uh, chromosomes replicate, there's mach cellular machinery that can uh, separate uh, the, the sort of sister uh, copies of the chromosomes. Uh, they're incredibly important, but they're almost entirely absent from the reference genome. Other sorts of things like segment duplications, other sort of biologically important uh, uh, segments are ent entirely miss missing in the reference genome. In fact, if you look at today, uh, human chromosome one from the from the NIH website, it begins N N N N N N N N N N N. These are unresolved nucleotides. We know about how many there ought to be, but the the technology just wouldn't let us uh, make sense of them. So why does this matter, right? If we're looking at variation and, and there's no reference, it's really hard or impossible to measure. If we're doing things like looking at gene expression or methylation, but there is no reference genome, we won't, we just, we'll be totally blind to that. You know, kind of the gist of it is, is we just won't know what we don't know. Again, a lot of this has been driven by these highly repetitive sequences. Here, for example, in chromosome X, uh, there are megabases of these timely uh, repeated units but are just incredibly difficult to sequence um, using standard sequencing approaches. The good news is in the here and now, we have new technologies. We have you know, extra nanopore devices. Uh, there's another company called Pacific Biosciences that also has a signal um, molecule sequencing device. And the virtue of this is that the reads that you can generate tend to be much, much longer than tra traditional approaches. Whereas the most widely used sequencing platform, the Illumina platform, can only reliably generate uh, reads that are about 100 nucleotides long. We routinely generate reads that are 100,000 nucleotides long or even a few million bases uh, using these um, new technologies. So with that comes an opportunity. You know, we, we know that the reference human genome is incredibly important. We know a huge fraction of it is missing or has errors or incomplete. Now, wouldn't it be amazing to apply it? these two technologies um, to actually make sense of it. That's been the whole sort of mantra and, and, and sort of uh, main charge of the telomere, to con telomere consortium is actually to build up complete representation. The telomeres are the very end of chromosomes. What if we can read from the very end of one, from the very end of a chromosome to the other end without any gaps or errors along the way for the very first time. So I'm very pleased to announce we've done that. Through the consortium, we were able to build up a complete representation What's shown here um, is a picture of the assembly graph. If I had another hour, I would tell you more about the algorithms behind how de novo assembly works. But the kind of the idea is we're, we can sequence individual molecules with these technologies. And then like a jigsaw puzzle, we can put them together uh, into uh, uh, put them together into longer and longer constructs. Normally when you do this, the sequences get all mixed together like a hairball, uh, but then get, thanks to new technologies, thanks to better algorithms, we can actually, out of the assembler, develop high quality representations, and then we can go back and then sort of uh, focus our efforts on the few remaining cycles and worlds, uh, the, the few remaining parts that couldn't be resolved automatically by the sequencing technologies. Now, using this new assembly, 
we've been trying to study um, you know, many different aspects about what this novel sequence is. Uh, we added about 200 megabases of novel sequence. We resolved um, thousands and thousands of errors that were present in the reference genome. So we've been studying this in many different ways and, you know, in terms of sequence content, how it can inform ancestry analysis, how it can inform genetic analysis, you know, what sort of errors may be present. All of, you know, basically we, we worked hard to kind of consider all this novel sequence in many different ways. Uh, one of the main things that we did was this, we think this should be considered a new reference genome. And one of the main applications for reference genomes is to take genetic information from other genomes map it onto it, um, call variants, uh, so that we can explore you know, how other people's genomes are related to each other. Basically, that's how almost every genome that has been sequenced to date has been analyzed, has been through mapping it to a reference genome. So we wanted to study how this new reference genome, this new um, telomere to telomere reference genome would impact variant analysis. And to do so, we looked at a well-established uh, collection of genomes uh, from a project called the Thousand Genomes um, uh, Project. So this is a cohort, it has a funny name, it's called the Thousand Genomes Project, but it's actually made up of 3,202 different samples that have been sequenced with short read sequencing. Uh, this is from the high coverage data that was recently announced from the New York Genome Center um, that is you know, freely available without restrictions. These, three, these 3,202 samples are from all over the world, um, uh, from uh, five different continental populations, 26 uh, subpopulations from different regions of, uh, around the world. Uh, now, this is a lot of data. The input to this was about 100 terabytes of uh, raw sequencing data. This did not fit on the Hopkins um, data center, so we had to use a cloud resource called the NHGRI ANVIL, uh, the Genomics Data Science Analysis Visualization and Informatics Lab Space. Um, that uh, builds upon the Google Cloud in order to support very, very scalable research. In the middle of this analysis, we were routinely using more than 10,000 cores all at the same time so they could rapidly do analysis of these uh, 3,000 genomes uh, data sets along the way. Now, the first sort of thing we did was we took these reads, we mapped them to the genome. First thing you do is like just look at sort of basic properties about how well these reads map to the new reference genome compared to the old reference genome. The first sort of major interesting result was these reads map much better to our new reference genome across all populations, across Europeans, Africans, East Asians, Americans, Southeast Asians. We saw that the number of sort of mismatches that you observe actually goes down. Now, why is that? The mismatch rate is made up of sequencing errors that are present in the reads, plus whatever sort of true genetic variability is, is there between the sample that you just sequenced and the reference genome that you just matched to. Uh, by, by sort of, for historical reasons, the reference human genome that is commonly used today actually has a very mixed ancestry where there's multiple donors. And as a result of that, no one, not from any sort of living population, maps cleanly to that reference genome. There's a lot of sort of um, artificial variants that you can think of them are brought along just sort of as a technical result because you're mapping to this artificial construct. Mapping instead to our new genome cleans this up. You get much better, much better mismaps. So other characteristics of the mapping reads are much better. And this is kind of a, a, a counterintuitive result. Even though we've added 200 megabases, almost an entirely new chromosome, the number of variants per person actually goes down uh, mapping to this new reference genome. We think this is a good thing because it'll clean up a lot of the technical artifacts um, that were present when mapping um, to the standard reference genome. Other things that we did was we looked, in addition to short read sequencing, we looked at long read sequencing, where we're mapping other samples that have been measured with Oxford Nanopore or the PAC Bio instruments. Same sort of thing. The mismatch rate goes down, meaning reads map better to our new T to T assembly than they do to the standard reference genome. Other sort of characteristics, like the variant calls that are made possible with the, the structural variant calls made possible with this new assembly also improve. For example, it used to be when you map to GRCH38, there's a certain set of variant calls that are present in every single person that you look at. We think a lot of these, what these really are, are mistakes in the reference genome, such that when you compare other data to them, you keep finding the same mistake, the same mistake, the same mistake in the reference genome. Mapping to our new assembly, those go away. The excess of variants that occur in 100% of individuals goes down. Other, other sorts of technical artifacts that you find with the, ref, with the standard reference genome, like the number of insertions and deletions, 
uh, is dramatically improved with this new assembly as well. So we have this new assembly. We think it improves variant calling quite broadly. Another amazing thing that it does is because we've assembled 200 megabases of extra sequence, we can actually sort of investigate um, uh, what those sequences are doing at a population genetic standpoint. And we found very strong evidence for signatures of selection where certain variants would only be sort of present in certain populations. So at the top, we have an example of certain variants only really found in South America. At the bottom, we find a set of variants uh, highly concentrated in say African individuals. Now from the data we have, it's hard to say exactly what the sort of uh, impact um, those variants will have on health or disease. But other studies that have looked for signals of selection have found in crucially important differences for drug metabolism, uh, me metabolic processing, these sorts of things. A lot of it is driven by the local environment. You know, if you're in an environment where you're constantly bombarded with you know, certain nutrients or certain pathogens, over time, over many generations, your genome will actually subtly shift to be able to respond to the environment you're, you're in. We see exactly these sorts of shifts in these novel regions of the genome that we're actively exploring uh, right now. Another amazing thing that you can do with this new reference genome um, for clinical genetics is there are you know, a large collection of genes that are known to be medically relevant. When we look at how some of those genes are uh, represented in the reference genome or our new TDT assembly, sometimes we find major differences. So here's an example of two genes that are represented in one order in the standard reference genome, and then they're, they're in the opposite order uh, in, the, in our assembly. And it turns out when we, when we, now that we know about this phenomenon, when we look at any single sample that we've uh, been able to measure since, they all match the T to T assembly. So the reference genome has that big structural error, which brings with it a lot of um, uh, challenges of read mapping. You get technical artifacts and the variant calls that are found there. That was sort of one example more broadly what we've been doing is looking through this uh, collection of about um, 273 medically relevant genes that are known to be difficult to call variants in. We compare the variant calls you get um, using GRCH38, the reference genome, our new T to T assembly. Uh, there's a substantial improvement in accuracy. The, there's a dramatic decrease in the number of false negatives. And then crucially, there's a, a, up to a 12-fold decrease in the number of false positive variant calls using our new assembly, right? So just a more faithful representation of these genes, reads map better, the variant calls are better. This is really gonna impact uh, clinical health um, uh, very dramatically. So there's a whole set of papers describing this new assembly, the variant calling, other sort of characteristics of the genomes. These are all under review right now, but you're very welcome and encouraged to go check out the preprints for all these papers. Very, very excited about it. But the punchline is we haven't yet been starting to call this GRCH39, but in every possible way that we can measure, this improves on the standard reference genome. I strongly encourage you to use it for your own analysis. So very broadly, you know, computer science plays a very, very central role in all of this work. Uh, it brings with it, you know, um, uh, uh, algorithms to look at the very lowest level of signal data, brings with it very scalable solutions to organize data algorithmics to be able to uh, make sense of it at scale, machine learning techniques to be able to attack these very, very subtle patterns. You know, with it, we're able to discover all kinds of new variants that have never been seen before. We're also able to um, sort of minimize or eliminate a lot of the false um, uh, variants that have previously been reported. Now we're gonna use this information to make very broad discoveries across the tree of life uh, to really understand how variants uh, impact our health and our life and our growth. It's really, really an exciting time um, to be working in the field. The future for all of this is integration at tremendous scales. We want to integrate genomics data with other measurements, you know, every, you know, even simple things like smartwatches or other sort of biomedical data. That's where the future lies to be able to relate changes in your genome to very subtle changes in your behavior or activities. I have a huge number of people to thank in my own lab, uh, all of our great collaborators. Uh, funding for this has been through NCI, NHGRI, the Mark Foundation for Cancer Research, NSF, and I'm funded at Hopkins through the Bloomberg Professors Program. Happy to thank you. I think we're running really short on time, but I'm happy to take a few questions now or feel free to reach out at any time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Professor.